All right, I think I'll, I'll kick it off. Uh, so uh, first of all, uh, thank you to the community for joining. We're just seeing an increased number of participants. Um, thank God there's not a, a sound indicator for that because it will get very, very, very noisy. Um, I've got an internal bet about what number of participants come as soon as Harry uh, follows anything. And of course, Atif compliments to you as well, both a strong combination. So uh, I'm, I'm sure it's going to get the post 100 mark, but we'll expect that in a bit. A um, couple of key things before we start. Uh, today's webinar is brought, of course, by, uh, brought to you by Park Launch. Uh, uh, Ali and the team, they've done a phenomenal job in, in, in building this community that's connected entrepreneurs and global investors. And, um, you know, it started off, I think, uh, 29th of April 2020 as kind of a single WhatsApp group. And now it's got 100K plus entrepreneurs. It's helped fund tons of companies and, you know, tens of millions of dollars and uh, really been a predominant uh, name. So Ali, well done and congratulations on your Two years in building this community i think you've done you and the team have done a fantastic job uh, i know you have a conference coming up in june so looking forward to attending that um and you know really uh, i think it's been uh, tremendous in being able to build up uh both the community so um with me i'm yusuf khan i'm a partner of ridge ventures i'm sometimes known as the uh, uh lowly intern unpaid at pop launch so uh do work for ali now and again um I, I get usually we get paid by Zareen's masala chai, but we haven't had that yet. So I, I'm building up my tab and credit with Ali to be able to do that. Um, with me today, two amazing guests. Uh, Harry Stebbings is here. Uh, Harry, great to see you again. Um, and Atif, great to see you. Um, both of you, actually, uh, we've got, uh, you know, we've got about 40 minutes and we've got some questions and the questions are going to come in quite fast. I don't want to, uh, the vanilla, uh, pr we wanted to promise that this was not a typical vanilla conversation. So I'm not going to go in and say, please tell me a little bit about your background. Everybody knows who your background is. If they really don't know, they should really be looking on your website. But what I will allow you to do is to just talk about just a little bit about the last, just in maybe 10 or 20 seconds, what have you been up to? How are things going? And let's just get 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 stuck in. And then I've got a bunch of questions about how you've been able to work together. So with that, Harry, how are you? How's it going? How, how's how's life been treating you? Great to see you here. Um, uh, it's going well. It's going well. As you last eighteen months, um, uh, about. 12 months ago, I raised $140 million and I split it between two funds, an early fund and a growth fund, 30 and 110. Um, I honestly find it very funny when uh, investors have theses. I think uh, the best founders um, will find markets and shape markets. Uh, my job is to find the very best founders and help them become even better in some small way. Um, and that's really all I do. Anything that takes me away from finding a great founder is not really time well spent. Um, I'm very passionate about emerging markets and very passionate about Pakistan. Um, invested in Airlift and BridgeLinks, both Indus Valley companies as well. And that's how me and Atif got you know familiar and you know sit on the board of uh, Airlift together now. And so that's the abridged version. Fantastic, fantastic. Atif, uh, great to see you. you've been uh, predominant in being able to help build uh, a venture ecosystem in Pakistan. So a, a lot of gratitude to you in terms of being able to drive that over the last several years. I think I, I connected with you when you were first starting up in this in, in fun one um, and very early on in the journey. Yeah. How's it going? How, I mean, you know, how's, it's been quite dramatic in terms of what you've had to go through, both with the pandemic and otherwise. Uh, thank you, Yusuf. Uh, and thanks, Park Launch. It's great to be here. Um, yeah, it's been crazy a uh, couple of years uh, for me as well as Pakistani startup ecosystem. If you go back to 2016 to 2018, we were doing $10 million a year for the entire country in VC funding, five cents per capita. Last 12 months, uh, Pakistani startups have raised um, close to $500 million. So just 50x growth in you know like three years. Uh, and that's phenomenal. I think that's a testament to uh, the potential of Pakistani founders, which you know like we've always believed in, um, and also uh, to Pakistani diaspora and the connections we've all been able to cultivate um, so been really, really amazing. Uh, I, I think uh, we've seen, you know, like with COVID, uh, there was this first slowdown, which didn't really turn out to be a slowdown um, after a few months. But this year, we're going to see a real slowdown globally. And I think like we'll talk more about that. But for Pakistani startup ecosystem, too, I think as we're maturing, 
this would be a challenge, uh, you know, for Pakistani founders uh, to go through and a maturation for the ecosystem as well. Um, so it's, it's great to be all growing together, very excited to be doing what I'm doing. Fantastic. Well, look, I think one of the shifts that have definitively happened is, I, I think, is really being even on the West Coast, uh, you know, where I'm based, you actually have seen a much more global shift. You start to see ecosystems being built all over the world. And I think uh, they've been actually and um, being activated by venture funding. So you're uh, definitively Pakistan has been kind of at the fastest growing, I would I would argue. But you've also seen that in Egypt, you've seen that in Nigeria, Kenya, definitively, where I grew up for some time. So, you know, I would like to try and pose this conversation from a global perspective, number one, and, and how you think about that. You guys have done a bunch of deals together. Super interesting airlift. Uh, we saw that announcement. My uh, credit to both of you, by the way, that was a bit of a watershed moment for a whole bunch of people in the diaspora. We were like kind of, you know, kind of in the typical Pakistani fashion, wanting to kind of go with good intention, not executing right away, but then finally getting there. I mean, I'll, I'll say that for myself in any case, but I think it was actually a bit of a really inspiring moment to be able to see, you know, you, Harry, of course, who I've known and followed for some time and learned from in terms of how you built up both the brand and, and contributed to the community. How did that deal come together? Tell us a little bit about the inside of it, if you could share with this audience, um, you know, how, as much as you wish to share, of course. And well, yeah, I mean, that's how you have it. I'm always in the game of oversharing. I told you I hate these boring um, yeah, answers. Yeah, totally. So I got sent this um, airlift by multiple people and I said, no, it's, um, you know, a terrible business model that loses money. I'm not interested. Thank you very much. And then some very smart people came back to me and said, actually, you're talking about Western business models, um, like some of the dominant players we have in the West. It's very different uh, for Airlift because you have cheaper real estate, you have cheaper labor, and a lot of the core cost of goods are not the same prices um, in the West. And so actually your unit economics are very different. So you shouldn't lump them all in the same bucket, so to speak. And Usman is a world-changing founder that spent five years at DoorDash. Um, and so I, I met Usman, I went through the numbers, I saw cohorts with the best repeat that I'd seen in, in pretty much anything. Um, and I realized that actually it was a phenomenal business and uh, I'd been incredibly stubborn. And I think this is one massive lesson with investing. Like, you're never smarter than the market. You never pretend like you actually know, like you have to spend the time, um, whether it's timing the market, market sizing, whatever it is. And here, there was just a lesson for me of, you know what? I was wrong. This is incredible. Usman is an incredible founder. Um, and then honestly, I just spent more and more time with Usman and I was going to put in uh, I don't know, five. Um, and then I was spending time with Usman and Josh Buckley, my closest friend, and we just kind of got more and more conviction and then put together more and more money um, and then ended up leading it with, with quite a considerable chunk. Um, and that's kind of how it came to be. Did you uh, actually, uh, before I ask you, Ari, did you think you'd be investing in companies? By, have you done, what, what, did you do? No, did you, no, I did not. You did um, not, you did not. I just no, wanted I to confirm not. that. You would, yeah, okay, right. No, I was not like, oh, I'm going to do emerging markets. And you know what I love though? You know what I love about emerging markets? It's fantastic. In the US and in the West, we, we invest and we make life 1% better for 10% yes. of people. When you invest in emerging markets and invest in companies like Airlift, you're actually making life 20, 30% better for 99% of people. You're having real impact on large swathes of the population versus making, you know, sales playbook coaching tools for SaaS teams. Yes. That's very different. And yeah. so I think it's super exciting, um, but it was not intentional. <laughs> right. Okay. Well, that's, that's good. Atif, you were there at the very early days. So tell us a little bit about the journey uh, and let's, you know, and then walk into, walk into the deal. Yeah. 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 So, so I first met Usman in um, January of 2019. He had just dropped out of INSEAD, uh, moved back to Lahar. And at, this is the same time I'm thinking of moving back. I'm like, this market, this doesn't make sense to not have any VC capital. I'm going to come back and do start a VC fund. And that was a huge validation actually for me that there are such smart people actually, you know, giving up other things to come and build things in Pakistan as well. Uh, and what struck me was, you know, Osman's uh, focus on people and everyone in Pakistan I had spoken to at that point, they were complaining about how difficult it is to find talent. And Osman had like a plan that he's drawing on the whiteboard and saying, this is how I'm going to hire and build the team. Two months later, 
uh, he's built the team, you know, like he's founded the founders, incredible founding team. He's built an app and he's, you know, like two weeks into operations. And that sort of speed of learning and execution, it's world-class, you know, and I, I knew I had to do it, right? And then I just like moved very quickly and partnered. And I think it's a great example for me of how like the founders at early stage are so much more important than the market because the business was a very different business, the mass transit business. And then COVID hits and that Osman correctly predicted that it was a multi-year event, not a multi-quarter event. And it was like, okay, that does not work in a multi-year COVID event. So what else are we going to do? Pivots to quick commerce. You know, again, that speed comes in very, very much. Uh, and I feel, you know, like going back to Harry's point of, you know, being, keeping an open mind and being flexible, that's what it takes to be great and we see in today's world, right? Like the world is just changing so much faster. There are opportunities everywhere. And I think that's what you've seen in terms of the partners that we've joined. We're very, very excited to uh, have such partners on board with us. I think, I think jumping on something you said there is, is like, you know, for me, when it comes to early stage investing, it, it doesn't matter what you do. It could be developer tools. It could be delivery. Right. It's how you do it. How does Usman hire? How does Usman build culture? That is how you see the qualities of truly great founders. When you understand what Usman does to attract the very best operators, it is intense. He sends me and Atif context, bios, hints right. ahead right. of time. He brings us into the process. There's planning right. meetings. That is the sign of someone who's truly, truly great. It doesn't matter what he does if it's a pre-seed or a seed. It's, it's how he does it. That's what you focus on. So um, not one, but then bridge links comes along and then yeah, and as that. So now, I mean, I, I don't know, there's maybe Harry Steddings Boulevard being planned somewhere down in Lahore right at the moment. Harry, isn't, you know, isn't I, I just wish they, I just wish they had more brothers and sisters. <laughs> yeah, 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 head over there basically. But uh, so, yeah, so look, now you've built up a relationship, you've done the deal with Airlift and Harry's like, well, yeah, that's one. Pakistan seems like an interesting market. How did bridge links come together? Is it this is just a natural collaboration? So is there a lesson learned for founders? Hey, by the way, you get a bunch of smart investors, build relationships and 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 take it from there. Is that is that what we're seeing? No, not really. Uh, okay. I was <laughs> I was chatting to Usman and yeah. he was like, Hey Harry, you should maybe meet my brother. He's he's got a great business too. And I was like, Okay, sure. Like that works for me. You know, most people often kind of have this when you're a VC and you're like, oh, okay, but Usman's got a high bar on good. And he's like, he's, he's really good. Right. So I was like, okay, I'll, I'll meet your brother. Great. And then I met, um, you know, Salman. I love Salman. Met Salman. Um, and he was like, yeah, you know, we think something's working. We're doing 7 million in annualized revenue. I'm like, you're doing 7, 7 million, million annualized <laughs> revenue? Uh, how long did that take you? He's like, well, you know, not too long, actually. And um, yeah, the, the, these are the amount of uh, shippers we have on board. And um, yeah, it's, it's really going well. Um, and so I was like, oh, wow. Well, you know, we should, we should do a deal. We should, we should work together. Oh, I wasn't really thinking about it, but okay. Um, and so that's how it came together. I mean, that one was just very, very obvious. He's, he's clearly, clearly brilliant, as is Usman, but the business was just taking off very early. Nice. Very nice, dude. Okay, so let's now change into just how you're... I mean, I think there has been a decoupling of the, of the market overall. We're starting to see innovation in all of these global markets. You know, if there's been massive differences that you've basically seen... Uh, Harry or Atif, both the experience of having worked in the US and Europe, and you've looked at some early stage companies. Are there some obvious differentiators that you tend to basically see other than lower cost of capital or labor otherwise? Is there, have you seen that in specific markets in companies, for example? Like, you know, in the West Coast, or at least in the US definitively, you're going to tend to see a big marketing push. You know, you've seen the, the sales playbook, a lot of B2B industry, et cetera. Have you seen you know, a growth in specific industries, for example, are, are you interested in that? Have you seen differences in the founder community? Would love to just hear like kind of your perspective of how you kind of experience the market overall. Atif, why don't you go first? Um, so, so I think the biggest difference um, is the kind of problems that you have to solve, right? So um, if you look at Maslow's hierarchy of needs, like in the emerging markets, you're solving these problems that are to do with logistics and food and, you know, shelter and um, a lot of the uh, existing infrastructure is broken. Your startups are coming up to fix that. Uh, whereas, you know, in more developed markets, especially in US, you know, you are thinking about things like NFTs uh, for college athletes, for Ivy League colleges. So it's so specialized and, you know, it's like, it's great if it works. 
And, and the implication for that is that early stage investment, which uh, it's hard to tell whether you'll have product market fit because right, sometimes you're investing, you know, like first couple of weeks into a, a, a team, uh, our first two investments were Airlift and Bazaar. Both happened a couple of weeks into operations of those companies. But I think one thing that was helpful was that you can better predict a strong product market fit. So, so if, if they are going after problems uh, that are very fundamental, fundamental to millions of people, right? Then, then if they solve for it, you know the demand is gonna be there. You know the market will be willing to pay for it. And I think what that leads to is it makes possible a more concentrated early stage fund model. So our fund one, just nine investments total. Right. Uh, now that allows us to then work much more closely with these founders, spend the time, take board seats, uh, and also have higher ownership. And I love that model. I think it's, it's a great model, do fewer things better. Whereas if I was building a fund in the US, I think those ideas would have such higher unpredictable uh, predict predictability that I would have to do 30, 40 investments. And I think that leads to a very different fund model. So I think that's the fundamental distinction. Uh, and I feel emerging markets are a much better opportunity uh, as a result uh, for early stage investing. Harry, you've seen big differences with this. Pitching style, markets, sectors. Well, yeah, no, um, yeah, there's a big difference. There's a big difference, especially on the fundraising. In the US fundraising, bluntly, and it's nothing against, um, you know, Pakistan or emerging markets founders, there is much less knowledge and awareness of the game to play. Now, that can actually be nice because it feels much more natural and authentic, but it can also not be as effective. Um, that it, you know, running a tight process, knowing docs, knowing how to run like, an effective fundraise, I find less common in emerging markets. And so I find founder knowledge around running an efficient fundraise to be much higher in the US. As I said, sometimes that can be too sales-like, but it is on the whole helpful. Um, I think also founders in the US actually raise for longer. I find in emerging markets, they're more comfortable with eight to 10 or 12 months of runway with each raise. Interesting. Stop, stop. We are not continuously fundraising. Like raise, build, raise, build. You can build relationships in between, but too many are just raise, 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 raise. No raise enough and then build. It's a big, big problem. Um, and it's one that I see happen too much. Okay, we've got some questions coming in, so I wanted to be able to pose those, but just before I do that, there's a very specific uh, uh, market shift that's happened. And Harry, I'm gonna just quote you on this. Yeah. Founders, you need to hear the truth. The funding market has changed. That raise you wanted, you aren't going to get. You are raising too much with too little. You will go out, burn lots of discussions, raising too much, then come back with smaller requests. Don't do this. Uh, you've put out quite a few of these, which definitely is uh, I'm not sure whether to take, I mean, cereal is required in the morning, but I think that's enough of a wake up call. Shift in the market in terms of public market valuations. Definitely it's affected a number of growth, growth companies who are going out to raise, probably raised a bunch last year, are basically holding on to that before they, have to grow into those valuations or worrying about a down round. Mm -hmm. How do you see the market at the moment? How does that impact Pakistan and emerging markets from your vantage point? Yeah, this is really bad. Like no one is actually, I don't think, quite aware of how bad this is. Um, and people are still saying, oh, deals are getting done, deals are getting done. No, yeah, they are for the very best companies. Cram downs are very real. These markets are unprecedented, I think, in the last 13 years. And people will point to, you know, the brief few weeks we've had around COVID. I think this is like the first sustained prolonged downturn. And I think this is not even the start. I think blub will be on the streets in the next six to 12 months. I think probably really culminating in Q1. And I think it's going to get a lot worse. Um, when I refer to that tweet, this knowledge isn't known by most founders who still think the markets are where they were last year. You right. cannot go out and raise your 12 million A on your 40, 50, 60, 70 K ARR. It just doesn't work like that. I'm, I'm really sorry. And right. so my concern is I've seen a lot of companies go out with too big a request. Everyone go, no way. And actually, they probably would have done it if you were going for the 4 million seed extension. But the 12 million A 
is no longer possible. It might have been last year. It's not now. You've got to be plastic to markets. Like Katif said quite rightly on, you know, investor mindsets and being plastic. Yeah. Founders have to be plastic and move with the funding environments. And I think that's crucial. And then I think, what does it do for Pakistan? I think wrongly, it makes life really, really hard. Right. And this is what I, I think is very sad because actually now's the best time to be investing, ironically. <laughs> like it is literally the best time. But I think it makes it hard. I think investors retrench back to domestic markets. Um, they retreat to safety. Um, and I think, you know, where's it challenging? It's challenging at growth where prices are higher. Um, and it's challenging in businesses that have more strained unit economic models um, and are in emerging markets. And so I think it's the best time, but I feel, do think we'll see a retrenchment from all the big players we saw moving back away from the emerging market, sadly. So we've got a ton of founders who are, who are watching this. What advice would you be giving them in terms of positioning with that realization? Cash conservation, business right. model optimization, extension of runway, um, you know, survival is the new success. Like nothing lasts forever. Um, this too shall pass. But right. right now we're moving close to the eye of the storm. And I think a much tighter focus around unit economics, a movement towards profitability as much as possible. And actually being aware, I hate founders shaping their business for VCs, but being aware that a focus on growth is no longer what VCs have, but unit economics, contribution margin, and a sustainable revenue generating business is where VCs are heading. So that's where I'd position my mindset as a founder today and show a pathway to that if I'm going out to raise now. And you want to see that in the pitches that you see and with your portfolio. Is that a fair, 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 fair assessment? Yeah, yeah, it is. Absolutely. I want to see the levers that we can pull to get to profitability. And then, you know, let, let's see how probable they are. Um, yeah. That's good. Are they... Yeah, so it's a complete uh, mind shift from six months ago. Um, I think that path to profitability is very, very, very clear. Now, if you're a founder who's just starting today, actually, this is a great time to start, right? Like maybe you won't raise a 2 million seed round, you'll raise a million dollars. It doesn't make much of a difference, to be honest. You know, like you'll just build slower. And by the time, you know, like you are ready to really scale, we'll hopefully be at the other end of this market. But anybody, if you've been around, and especially in emerging markets, Harry is right, you know, they unfairly um, get the, you know, long end of the, the short end of the stick. And those are considered high risk. So that entrenchment like first happens in emerging markets. It affects, uh, you know, growth stage companies um, more. So I feel like that's the red zone where you have to be really, really careful. Uh, and doing everything you can to extend that runway to 12 to 18 months. I think that's the most important thing, bring in more cash, uh, cut down on expensive, figure out, you know, like how to change the business model to be, to have that path to profitability. And on that, I think you don't want to be slow, you know, like you don't want to say, look, let me see another two months and see how the market trends. I think like, if you have to make those changes, the sooner you do the better. Uh, yeah. and adapt to that changing market and hunker in for the long run. And, you know, like, again, uh, a year from now, we might be in a very different market and that would be the time to then again, change your strategy and go back. Right. Yeah, I'm so with you. It's such a good point, Atif, on like now being the time, not next month, not two months, like now and time. being very, very diligent around execution. I think the other thing is like in the US, there's a lot more fear of running out of cash, it would seem actually from the founder perspective, which is maybe, yeah, I didn't expect like the US, when they hit six months of runway, they're out pounding the pavements fundraising. Yeah. Often I'm meeting emerging markets founders and I'm saying, what is the cash profile looking like? How much do we have left? And they're going two months. And I'm going, wow, that's a <laughs> 20, like you're going out to raise a 20 to 50 million round, even if I sign today, with right. legal transactions, Actions. you may not get cash. Right. Like right. you fundamentally have leverage when raising and the less time you have, the less leverage you have. And right. so two to three months is not okay for right. going out to raise. Right. Okay. So one of the things to, it's very conscious, kind of the elephant in the room is when you look at global investing, there's always this aspect of, well, don't know the market well, haven't been there in some cases, I keep hearing about things in the news about the politics otherwise. And that applies to all markets, candidly speaking. Um, I, I came to the conclusion that 
Honestly, every country, West, East or Central has its problems and there's always gonna be market dynamics. But you know, there, has, there has been this notion on the emerging markets like, oh, well, how do we look at the economic turmoil? How do we think about political changes? I think from my vantage point, if you think about early stage investing, it's gonna take you five, 10 years to build a great company over time. So you know what? If you believe in the right business, you believe in the market in the longer term and you're gonna go into that perspective. But Harry, when this was first investment in Pakistan, but now you're definitively looking at probably more deals in emerging markets. How have you thought about it? And then Atif, to you, you made a shift, right? You've come back home, so to speak. Um, and yeah, it, again, Pakistan has had its checkered history on the politics side. How did you start to climatize and say, okay, I, I'm gonna build a, a venture ecosystem and be part of you know, investing in early stage companies from that vantage point? <laughs> I think I think there's rarely a Pakistan deal that raising north of 30 million that I don't see having done that left round. Um, right. But um, yeah, I, I think about it in the same way that I think about investing in the West. If I had a company that said, oh, I only want to be in the UK, I would challenge them. Right. And I think, you know, diversification on a customer and a revenue basis by geography is always important, whether it's moving from the UK to France, Germany and Spain, or whether it's US to Europe, whatever. So like, you know, bluntly, I think it's important that you always have diversification in that way. You know, Airlift is now in South Africa, plans for expansion to other countries. It, it mitigates all forms of risk when you have diversified geos. And I think it's the same when investing anywhere. Now you do have slightly more around kind of, you know, political questions and, you know, everything that comes with that. But yeah. as you said, this is a five to 10 year you know, investment journey at the minimum. Right. Honestly, I just don't think any of us are smart enough to predict out the political environment in 10 years. Right. And then, well, you know what, Yusuf, what's the IPO market going to be like in 10 years? Can you tell me that? No, no, I can't either. Exactly. So yeah. let's just, I, investors are masters at overcomplicating things. It allows us to justify our fee structure. Um, the truth is we need to invest in the best founders in the world who are changing the game. It is that simple. And the hardest thing is how do you win those deals? That is the question. I think that's a lot of, that's a lot of encouragement for a lot of founders who immediately come in with this mindset. Well, you know, are you interested in Pakistan? Are you blah, blah. I'm like, look, do you want to build a great company? Yeah. Yes. Go build a great company. Let's figure that piece out. Everything else will take care of itself. And you're not doing that overnight. It's going gonna, it's gonna to take some time. So let's just actually look at the fundamentals and the team you want to put together. So I think that's my vantage yeah. point. Yeah. I think on your standpoint, what you know, would love to hear your kind of mindset. Yeah. Change look, look the political stuff is just noise, right? Yeah. The macroeconomic stuff is relevant, but I think it's overrated, overrated. Uh, now look at what happened in the U.S. So we Trump got elected. You know, like people just a lot of people panicked. Then you had a very different government, two parties that have very different political philosophies, very different economic philosophies, and. At the end of the day, I don't think it impacts startup and venture ecosystem that much, uh, to be honest. In Pakistan, actually, it's even less so because the bet uh, of startups and venture in Pakistan is not on the macro economy. It's not that Pakistan will, you know, like uh, start growing much faster. It's on the economy coming online. You have a $350 billion economy that's at one to 2% online. Once that goes to 20% online, you create, you know, like 70 billion, even with zero projected growth, you create $70 billion in annualized online spend. Give it a low enterprise value multiple of, you know, 3X. You have $200 billion in enterprise value to be created in Pakistan. Who will create that? It's going to be new companies, right? So it's, it's as simple as that. Um, everything else is noise. I think in the short term, yes, it matters, uh, uh, you know, mostly because of perception impacts, which I hope, you know, global investors don't, or way at as much. Yeah. And then the final point on that is in Pakistan, all political parties, they have very similar economic policies. Yeah. You know, uh, they all want power, but ultimately at the end of the day, they all are trying to bring more FDI in. They all are very, very supportive of tech startup and ecosystem actually access here uh, to the prime minister, no, no matter what party it is for startups that are doing well for the VC ecosystem at large is very straightforward. There's lots of support by the regulators. And we expect that to continue. Okay. And, and he's right, going back to you and just for the founder audience here, I think one thing as well as like, you know, investors invest in lines, not dots. You cannot just come to investors now because you want to raise. It right. doesn't work like that. 
trust is the only currency we have and that is built over time and so i would have five to ten names of investors that you want to build trust in a relationship with and then every quarter i would update them on the progress of your business it could be with an investor update it could be with a zoom call it could be with a twitter dm i don't care the touch points are what counts and so have those five to ten names build that level of trust and then when it comes to the raise it's not yusuf nice to meet you. I'm raising $10 million. Yes. It's, hey, you followed the journey. You've seen our expansion into this and this and this. And now we're actually raising to move into, you know, South Africa or wherever we're moving. Um, That's how you do it. And I don't find actually enough in emerging markets, invest in lines, not dots on the relationship side for investors. Yeah. By the way, the, uh, just uh, as a, a note of caution, for those of you, uh, Harry has a followership uh, expanding several million and the downloads for 20 million bucks. If you are a startup and you've hired a PR team and you want to be on the podcast, uh, don't email him. Uh, he needs to build <laughs> relationships and trust uh, and he needs to get that. He gets those requests all the time. Is that, is that right? Is that, uh, that's a fair, I, I thought, uh, my, I, I thought my, I'd save my, your email inbox a little bit of a tie, right? I mean, my, my, my girlfriend reads my tweets to me and I shiver. Um, yeah, 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 no, I mean, it's the worst, but PR are the worst. They email you cold, say, Hey, my client wants to come on your show. Come on. Well, look, <laughs> let's, let's, let's talk about, look, it's a competitive market in terms of early stage companies. You're competing for mind share. Uh, um, because everyone's trying to figure out whether they should be looking at the final episodes of, say, Ozark on Netflix. I mean, that's, you're just competing for mindshare every single day. Um, Ari, you've been, uh, you know, absolutely epic in terms of being able to build a brand, build a platform which is connecting finance and media. You know, when you look at some of the early stage companies, now they've got more competitive, uh, have to be more competitive than before. For the founders that are out there who are building some early stage companies, could you give some, offer some advice in terms of how they get their name out there, where they need to put in the effort? And it does take a lot of effort, but it's not easy. So just a, a couple of tidbits would be really good. Yeah, yeah. I think first of all, messaging sucks. 99, and this is not emerging markets focus, this is the US as well. The messaging sucks. The brilliance of great brands is you stand for them or against them. It doesn't matter if people hate them, it do, but you will have people who love them then too. But you have to have people resonate with it in some way. You have to be strong and bold. If you are doing an accounting solution, say the current system sucks. Don't say aligning your revenue team. Right. That doesn't excite anyone. You right. have to be bold and you have to be courageous. And actually, you sometimes have to be a little bit arrogant in your marketing. You have to sell ahead. You have to sell the vision. People you know, want to know why you do it, not what you do to Simon Sinek, which is quite right. And so I think be bold, be courageous. You've got to stand out from the crowd. Um, and then I also think it's in the neutral where like everyone fails. And so I would just think about the most adventurous ways you can put your me messaging out. Um, and then also like, if you're building content plans, like I think content for sure, obviously is, you know, the, the future of organic brand building, but my word, it takes money and it takes time and your payback is years. Right. So be prepared. This is not a sideshow. And this is full people and teams on this if you want to do it well. Um, yeah. And I think okay. people really underestimate that. Okay. So question for both of you. It's coming through. Um, let's talk about founders do and don't. So let's just go on the negative. There's a bunch of stuff that founders are pitching to you. What shouldn't they do? What pet peeve or otherwise? Artif, you first and then Harry over to you. Um, so, so my biggest one would be, you know, like when founders don't have a good reason to do that startup and, you know, like you can tell they're doing it because it's cool to be a founder. Right. Um, and, and, and my advice on that is, you know, if you want well, to- By the way, that applies passion, to being a VC as well. So I just want to let you know. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly right. More, more so to VC than founders, I'd say. Um, uh, but look, if you want to build a billion dollar company, I think like it's important to know you'll have to grow into the leader- who will have to manage thousands of employees, manage a company, you know, doing probably 100 million plus in revenue and so on. And that's actually not fun or sexy unless you really believe in, you know, what you're building mission. And I think like that's what we stress a lot on early on. And uh, it's a very good binary predictor of, you know, like, do we want to partner with the founder or not? Harry, what shouldn't they do? You've got a long list. But oh, man, I, I mean, I'm, I'm writing here. Actually, yeah. I mean, number one, 
Like there's just like things to say in investor meetings, which you just like, no, never say it. Like this will be the last raise before we're profitable. No, don't ever say that. That is the worst thing. And you just lose all credibility. Two, when investors um, provide feedback or actually turn you down, don't argue back. I, I know most often investors are wrong. I agree with you. They're naive and they don't know your market as well as you do. But don't argue back, actually. In the graciousness, you might be able to get another investor intro out of them. That's a really interesting point, actually, Yusuf. Given your thoughts on our go-to-market, are there any others that you'd recommend having been a CIO for many years? Oh, that's a very good point, Harry. Actually, yes, you should speak to Sarah. Great. Turn it around. Um, I would also say, like, you know, it, it, the big one is, like, if we all appreciate that mission is so important, the thing I just find crucial is, like, you just have to repeat it till you're like bored. And right. every time it has to be better and more charismatic because for someone, it's the first time that they're hearing it. And I think that's crucial. And I, we also, and the other thing that leaders, I think first time leaders forget is as a leader, your whisper is heard as a scream. And so you have to be very cognizant of the weight of your words. Um, you know, I will never say my view, I'm very opinionated here, I will never say my views in investment committees, in you know, team meetings, before I've asked everyone else first. And actually what I do, I'll always send out a Word doc the night before, I'll get everyone to write their thoughts on the Word doc, send them back to me, so it's not a collaborative doc, because then people don't think say what they really right, think, because right, right, you've right. imparted their mindset. Um, crucial. Right, fantastic. Okay. Uh, there's there's one vanilla question which has been asked multiple times for, for VC, so I have to ask it because the people are asking. Um, a mistake or a miss that you like, hmm, that I should have probably done that. Feel free to. <laughs> you go, and of course, the vanilla answer, Harry, as you well know, oh, there's tons of mistakes, of course. How long have you got? Just give us one or two. I think I've lost about a half a billion in oh, misses. Yeah. I think I genuinely think it's probably about that. Actually, if you go first, because okay. I'll feel terrible. Uh, yeah, so so I think, you know, like uh, the anti-portfolio question is always interesting. We like to track that a lot. Pakistan is too early. I'm sure there are tons. I'll find out uh, more. One I would call out is um, I think the... Um, uh, you know, like delivery space. Um, so as e-commerce is scaling in Pakistan very fast, um, you have to have better courier companies. The incumbents uh, like TCS in Pakistan have been very weak. So there have been a couple of startups. Uh, there's Postex, uh, there is Swift, uh, and we looked at them, but you know, like uh, Postex case, like we didn't move fast enough and others, you know, like uh, they weren't early enough, but I think that's the one sector where I do feel it's very exciting. It's gonna be very big. And so far we have missed out on that. Uh, maybe we'll get a shot at it again in future. Okay. Uh, half a billion, one billion plus. I'm I'm definitely at a few hundred million. I'm still early on. So. Oh, I mean, mine is brutal. Yeah. I mean, I think one that was very well known is Pipe, the revenue replacement product. I think I saw that at, I don't know, five or 10 million valuation. It's now a 5 billion valuation. Um, yeah, well done, Harry. Uh, and I knew the founder. That was incredibly I mean, it's so stupid. I've known the founder. I thought he was brilliant. I'm, terrible decision. Um, and I mean, then there was Deal, you know, the uh, API for payroll and compliance, scaled to 100 million in revenue. Every single round, I turned it down. Like the first round, the, thir the 30 million round, the 100 million round, it was always too expensive. Um, and I think it's the lesson on pricing, which is like under a certain threshold, if the founder is truly amazing, like Alex, then you pay up for it. Um, and actually you have to, you know, be aware of the ex exception, but move with it. Um, I, those are probably two of the most lucrative. One that I'm feeding a lot right now is Riverside.fm, a podcasting yep. platform that just raised 35 million. Unbelievable. I, again, really big lesson here. Yep. I know everything about podcasting, right? I've done it for seven years. Biggest miss. You know too much. Right. I, it was the expert who's wrong. Right. Um, so just don't think you're smarter than the market. Um, and that was a big failure of mine. Okay, good. Um, last couple of questions. Um, if there are new sectors that are being born and uh, industries are being transformed on a pretty regular, uh, the cycles are a lot faster. We weren't talking about in cybersecurity, for example, we weren't talking about ransomware until several years ago. Now it's basically an entire practice. It's got sectors, etc. Same thing applies to crypto. Yes, 
Coinbase and a whole bunch of, I mean, we talk about digital currencies, but then we started talking much more about NFTs. Now we're looking at blockchain enterprise use cases. How have you thought about those industries irrespective of, of global or otherwise? Just Harry, um, you've been investing and been talking to investors and founders for years. What's the, what's the thought? Well, uh, despite much enthusiasm from my Italian girlfriend to enter the world of Web 3, um, yes. I still like Web 2. Um, I think supply chain and logistics, I think supply chains are fundamentally broken at the scales that we haven't seen in many, many years. Um, there is huge, huge opportunities to reinvent supply chains in a much more meaningful and data-oriented way. I think compliance tax management, um, payroll management, um, crucial as we move into kind of a truly globalized workforce. Um, I think insurance as well. And really all of kind of back end infrastructure again, um, which I think needs a whole new layer of reinvention is where for me, I get very excited. Um, and uh, <laughs> so less sexy, but I think that's yeah. where, I, that's where I, I get super jacked. Yeah, well, I, I spent 20 years as CIO basically building part of these systems. And so I think that the reality is new architectures are required. So I'm, uh, I share but, that. Hopefully it's also a case of like knowing what you don't know, though. So like I won't ever invest in cyber, Yusuf, and I won't do cyber because man, you know so much about cyber. If yeah. me and you are looking at cyber deals, you're going to be a way better investor. I don't ever want to be in an investing field where I'm significantly behind. Right. So like know the game you're playing and stick to it. Right. But if I, so if I came to you with a podcasting analytics marketing solution, you'd be like, wait a second, let me tell you whether this thing works or not. Yeah. <laughs> but you need to, but you want to have like multiple different references. So right. you don't have the moron that's me with Riverside. <laughs> Atif, on your side, when you look at sectors for Pakistan specifically, I mean, look, it, country's growing, venture capital is, is growing, the ecosystem is starting to get there, irrespective of, of political or economic shifts. I mean, we've been through that for decades. I mean, I think you and I can agree with that. So we've got a thick skin, candidly speaking. So I remain bullish. Any specific sectors you're super excited about? So, so, so we are sector agnostic. And I think yeah. that's the way to um, go about when you have a country focused fund, you're already you know, concentrated. So you get some diversification through multiple sectors. Uh, the themes that are we're excited about, I think first one is infrastructure. And this is true of all emerging markets where the governments essentially did not invest in infrastructure either because they were not competent or they didn't have the money. So you have this private sector using tech and you know tech enabling infrastructure. So whether that's B2B commerce, which is what Bazaar ended up doing, uh, which was a second investment, raised more than $100 million, uh, whether it's bridge lengths, which is you know, taking logistics and trucking and uh, you know, organizing that, um, uh, whether it's mass transit, what Airlift started out to do, for instance. Uh, so I think infrastructure as a whole, uh, there's so many layers to it, every industry. And then on top of that infrastructure, the fundamental constraint always ends up being lack of working capital. So no matter which sector you start with, uh, you start solving a problem and then you realize that the real problem for people is actually lack of access to this capital. So then you build that layer of providing capital as part of that infrastructure solution. Very strong combination, very, very excited about that. So that's one theme. The second theme I feel is this uh, mispricing of um, talent in emerging markets. Uh, so, you know, um, talent is everywhere. Uh, I think we can all agree on that. And in an increasingly connected world, uh, what that talent can do, that's also, you know, like uh, become much larger than a couple of decades ago. Despite that, I think uh, there is a mismatch between the opportunities and talent. So one of our investments was remote based, which is basically placing entire teams of talent in emerging markets with the best companies in the world. And, you know, like, the demand, you know, like they don't have a problem with demand, like everybody needs this. And I think like just being the marketplace that makes that connection is supremely valuable. And you can apply that to everything. You can apply that to finance. You can apply that to, uh, you know, uh, all sorts of, uh, you know, things that require any human input uh, and increasingly emerging markets would see that, you know, like they have this potential that's unrealized. So we'll see more and more of that. Uh, to happen so those are the two that we're really excited about on the talent side there's two big things at play here though one is like as markets crash which you know they have and they will do even more so people don't leave what is safe jobs but two is you know before it was very cool to join the hot fast-growing company with the high valuation now there's zero upside 
to join a super cool company with a massive valuation. And so I think the ease of attraction for startups to get those incredible operators is actually higher with the realization that you want to join bridge links at 100 million or 200 million versus joining your hot startup at 3 billion. Where are you going to make more money on your equity? Right. It's pretty obvious. And so I think it's, it's interesting to see these two different powers at play. Okay. You've both been involved in portfolio companies. Your founders have said only wonderful things. I checked around. Harry, I promise I won't quote any more of your tweets. But uh, what I will ask is, um, your involvement with portfolio companies, what, you know, each of you, op- every, we all operate differently from that standpoint. I get more involved, for example, on if you're selling to CIOs, I can help a portfolio company on being able to look at that messaging or enterprise go to market. Harry, where, where, how, how do you balance your time from that standpoint, portfolio construction, company portfolio yeah. help? Yeah, I think it's a really good question. I think twofold. One, um, I'm very humble in terms of what I know and what I don't know. When it comes to fundraising, I think few people are as well connected as me, having done 3,000 shows with VCs and knowing every partner pretty much in venture individually. Um, But that's pretty much it other than product marketing and content marketing. Like product strategy, expansion, I don't know. And I'm very aware of what I don't know. But I aim to be the world's best switchboard. So whether you have a problem on uh, login challenges or you have a problem in integrating referrals into your consumer dashboard, I have the best operator in the world for you to speak to on the same day. We have 20 product, 20 growth, 20 sales, 20 marketing. On demand, we can connect you to the single best person in the world to help you solve your problem. Um, And so I think my job is to be the best switchboard in the world and to be very aware of what I do and don't know and bluntly give the founders the access to the best people who've done it before. It's that simple. Fantastic. Hatif? Having seen Harry in action, I can vouch for that. So he'll pop up a name and then he'll get at the person to respond in five minutes too. So so that's an amazing Mm -hmm. superpower. Um, look, for me, my background has been, you know, I um, built LinkedIn's growth team, so consumer products, growth, product strategy, love doing that. Uh, so tend to over-index that, but becoming a VC, I also realized that if you back the best founders, they often don't need help with that. You know, they get uh, really, really good uh, very quickly. Um, so then it switches to fundraising. And I think like being from a very nascent market, like that still is the most important thing. And there is a lot that goes into it, you know, it's, it's uh, about, you know, finding the list of VCs you want to attract, but also building that relationship over time and figuring out what, who's the right partner there. And, you know, like, what's the sequencing and how do you map, not just look for this round, but like, what do you need to the next round? So all sorts of those conversations, but generally speaking, very involved, uh, you know, all, always available. And that's why we have the concentrated approach. Uh, so whatever is highest on the founders list, either I try to help and often uh, when I can't, then, you know, we have an LP base, which is also operators and VCs. So in our fund one, we had 80 plus individuals, all, you know, like founders, operators, VCs, uh, so we can loop them, loop them in to help. I've offered it before, but if any of you, if any of your portfolio companies need help on understanding enterprise good mic from a CIO vantage point, I'm happy to basically. Would that. love that. I think we're still in the consumer stage, yeah, but we'll know, get I'm... to enterprise B to be soon uh, in the second wave, and I think uh, would love to take you up. I, I think it would just be a lot more fun to be perfectly honest from my standpoint. Would work with you. So yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, questions coming on uh, about incubators and accelerators. Viewpoints on this. Uh, you know, founders need to, to get the, the, the truth. So, uh, Harry, I can either dig up a tweet. Uh, or well, I mean, I mean, incubators that. seem to be like newsletters from 2015 and podcasts from 2018. Everyone bloody has one today. Right. Um, what do I think? I think few are actually worth it, but some are very worth it. Um, I would think I would optimize for very high touch, small batches. Um, I think that's where value is driven. High touch, um, small batches. Yeah. Okay. High touch, small batches um, with great, great operators running them. I bluntly see a lot of operators running them who aren't very good or right. failed operators right. and uh, do your work on who's running it. Um, honestly, I think in most cases, you don't need to take it. The truth right. is they are expensive. They actually generally, generally provide little and actually, you can do it on your own or with a brilliant investment from Indus at the early stage, more efficiently, more cheaply. Um, so honestly, in the majority, except for the 
creme de la creme five percent i say lean away focus on product early and work with great pre-seed and seed investors fantastic Adi? uh so i i agree and what i'd add is you know especially in the emerging market uh, you know uh, markets when you go and join a global accelerator often that context is missing so you know like we've seen uh, some very counterproductive advice from good accelerators like YC. And I think like this also goes back to all advice is context dependent. Um, so from that perspective, sometimes people overrate the advice they get from these partners, but in emerging market con constructs, better to work with people on the ground, uh, better to work with investors who are actively investing in, in emerging markets and have experience um, there uh, rather than the accelerators. Um, a couple of questions comes in about people who want to look at careers in VC. If there's, uh, I think, Harry, very difficult qu question for you to answer when the question is, who, um, who's your favorite interview? Uh, or, I, can but, say, I can say that. That's you easy. Can. Fair yeah, enough. Yeah. Doug Leone at Sequoia, absolute dream interview to do. Peter Fenton um, at Benchmark, dream interview to do. Chris Sacker, what a hero. This guy is the OG of humans. Uh, I mean, his thoughts on you know children and parenting, fantastic. Um, so I'd say they are three that really stand out. Uh, in terms of investing, I, I, do you know what? I think this is like the, the easiest one and it's what no one does. You want a job in venture? Put five VCs on a list every month, send them three deals that are aligned to the deals that they like to do. You can see their deals on Twitter, on their portfolio page. Do your work. Send them one or two deals a month even for six months. I promise you, if you do that with the reasoning why you think it's interesting specifically for Yusuf, after six months and 12 deals sent, he will be interested in hiring you if they are good and high quality and very aligned to his preferences. No one does this. No one. It is not that challenging to do. Like, that is what you have to do. And then the other thing, show how you are different. Do a series of events around healthcare investing, around consumer social investing. Set up a newsletter with a following. So do whatever. You have to be different. Having a passion for technology, not good enough. You have to prove that you stand out from the crowd. Fantastic. I think uh, investors that you look up to uh, and guidance on career and venture. Um, yeah. So, uh, you know, I really like what first round has done as an early stage, uh, we see, you know, establishing the community centered approach, uh, thinking of venture as building a product for founders. And I think they started doing it earlier. And today when capital is so abundant, it's very clear that a dollar is a dollar. So actually founders are also picking VCs and then the question is what's your product and that could be the individual partner but it could be a series of programs around that so so I, I really love uh, uh, what first round uh, has done um, and then in terms of career advice I think like Carrie's advice like it won't even take you like months if, if you do it first time uh, you know and and the bar is so low um, you know like a really really good cold email stands out so much the, that yeah. first email. Uh, and if you do what Harry said, you know, like you'll get noticed by the best VC in the world if you're doing it right. Um, uh, I, we, we are, uh, uh, you know, going to be expanding our investment team. So uh, would love to actually, you know, throw that <laughs> out there. So if, right you, now. Uh, if you are interested, do reach out uh, and we'd love to engage. Okay, well, you, you, Yusuf, Yusuf, should we join us as two interns? Uh, I, yeah, I, can, I uh, think we've already applied. Yeah, totally. Yeah, I, I DM'd him via Twitter right now. It's the only way I'm going to get <laughs> this. Yeah, totally. Didn't accept my LinkedIn request for two years. I'm just kidding. We haven't, no, we're going to no, meet no, up no, very no, soon. No. I'm looking forward to it. No, okay, I, uh, I couldn't resist uh, this opportunity with so many people tuned in. To, no, to uh, I, I think it's a perfect plug, <laughs> totally. Uh, um, there's going to be one more just before we finish this. So uh, last question, and I've got one more thing, which is... Um, one or two things quickly on the founder side. When a founder is selecting a VC and you've been there, you've seen all of the shenanigans, you've seen investing practices, good, bad, and ugly. One, two pieces of advice about selecting the right partner. What should they be doing? I mean, it, it, yeah. Other than take a term sheet from Indus Capital. We get that piece. But just, <laughs> what, what, what's uh, the I, I think like uh, um, the market, like your stage, fit is very, very important, right? So, so if you're a, you know, like CDC company, I think it matters much less who the VC is. I think speed matters a lot, the capital, 
um, um, matters a lot. I think earliest stage, you do want to make sure it's a partner who'd be able to truly help you. Uh, and that would also depend on your company. So for certain companies, you know, like we'd be great fits. For other companies, we might not be. And I think just spending that time and actually asking those questions. So the mistake I see founders make is they, uh, in their minds, there is this uh, power imbalance, right? So the VCs are the one giving you money and writing the check. So when the conversation happens, the founders are not asking any questions. Or if they ask a question, it's one of those, you know, interviewee, like feel good questions and not really actually, uh, you know, uh, asking the hard questions on the VCs. And I suggest doing that and having a very open conversation. And that process tells you how it would be down the road because this is VCs on their best behavior. If in that conversation, they come off, you know, like as not the right fit, uh, run away. Okay. Harry, quickly. And then we'll... yeah, yeah, it's easy to be really nice when everything's going well. Every VC's had companies that fail or go badly. Ask them for introductions to them and you'll clearly understand how helpful they were and if they supported in the tough times. Honestly, don't over-optimize for terms. It's bullshit. Um, having 10 million more at certain stages versus someone else doesn't matter if you have a great fit with someone. It's, it's a long time you're with them. And actually spend the time to build the relationship. I say do the 36 New York Times questions if you Google them and go through them. Go through them with your VC. Like, tell me, who was your childhood hero? Why? Um, what song did you get married to? And was your first dance? Why? All of these things are really actually important. It's not just about the cash. It's about the person behind it. And I don't think people really spend enough time either optimizing for that relationship or actually building it. Okay. Well, okay. So first of all, thank you very, very much. There's some questions about how to get in touch with you. Uh, first of all, there's an open invitation to Harry to come visit Pakistan. Uh, I think you'll do a multi-city tour. Uh, I will happily drive, I will happily guide, um, and we'll basically take some flights together. Happy to do that. So I'm, I'm in on that one, no problem at all. Um, more importantly, um, how to contact you. I think, uh, Artif, you've already got jo job applications coming into play, so stay tuned for that, heads up. I think what I'd give advice to everyone is, it's as Harry has basically mentioned, figure out how to, how to connect in terms of introductions, but do it from a valuable standpoint. Time do not do action. not send LinkedIn invites do, do cold. Not, it not is not a good them. idea. Not a good idea. Not a good idea. Well, uh, for some, I, I'm okay with that. But yes, every, each of us have our preferences. So totally fine. But um, I'll leave it from that standpoint. <laughs> lastly, lastly, so it's the month of Ramadan. Eid's coming up. So wishing everyone happy Eid. I'm putting uh, my zakat donations in place. Harry, I know uh, MS is something which is very close in your family. So rest assured, I want to make sure I give a plug. If there's a, a charity you want to basically mention specifically, I always make a point that every time I speak to you, I always make a donation because uh, I, you know, you've been very helpful to me in my career. So I'm going to make a donation to the MS Society. Um, Atif, is there a charity that you would like to mention to, to give a mention for this? Month? Yeah, I would give a shout out to the Citizens Foundation, TCF. Yeah. Um, it's an incredible, I think, one of the leading nonprofits in education sector. They're close to 2,000 schools uh, that they've built over the years. Um, and uh, it's just having an incredible impact on uh, hundreds of thousands of people's lives now. So right. please donate well, if you can. Harry, feel free to give name a charity mention if you'd like, but I'm I'm, 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 I'm I'm so touched you remembered it, my friend. The MS Society, my mother's got MS and it's pretty brutal for sufferers so very touched by that Yusuf that's really made my day my friend good uh, memory absolutely absolutely well, listen uh, thank you everyone for for time thank you again for the park launch team wishing everyone a very great Eid Mubarak and looking forward to, to reconnecting Harry I beg of you somewhere down the line I intend to do a deal let's try and do that this year all right we will do it my friend I look forward to it I always, looking forward always to great. finally and doing yes. one together between the three of us it'll be a lot of fun uh, thank it. you, Yusuf, Harry, Bye. everyone for tuning in. Bye. Thanks, Thanks team. Take care. All right. Bye. Take care. All the best. Bye-bye.